Welcome to Focus on Seniors, a television show sponsored by Helping Seniors of Brevard County, Florida. The show is designed to make you aware of senior issues, needs, and resources available to help us age in place and with dignity. This show will help you as you develop your own aging and care plan. Now, here is your host, Joe Steckler. I'm Joe Steckler, and welcome to Focus on Seniors, the television arm of Helping Seniors of our Kind. Our show is designed to provide you with information on how to develop your own aging and care plans. Our topic today is 911 responders. And with me here at Brevard County Fire and Rescue Station number 62 is Mary DeMouche and Cameron Burse, both firefighter paramedics for the County Fire and Rescue, as well as Orlando Dominguez, who is the Division Chief of the Emergency Service with the Brevard County Fire and Rescue. This show is particularly important to me, folks, because Mary and Cameron are the two paramedics that responded to my call for help. It was placed by my wife on December 19th. I felt at the time that it was important for people to know more about just what 911 responders did, what their training was, and why it's important for all of us to know more about what they do. And so as we start the show today, I personally want to thank all of the emergency responders throughout Brevard County for the wonderful job that you do to assist people in need. It's sort of an unsung story that people don't really talk about. And I hope we can get a little bit of that in the show today. But my first question to all three of you, and as we go through this, just respond how you might. It, it, there's no set order on who answers what question. I just want good information. What is the mission of a 911 responder? Well, I'll ask Scott Lando. Sure, it's, really it, it, it's, it's pretty simple, Joe, and that's to provide the best quality emergency medical care to the citizens and guests of Brevard County. Our goal is to arrive on the scene, begin stabilization, begin caring for that victim, continue that care throughout our transport, and then deliver them to the emergency room staff that's waiting for them, the victim. Did you start your career as a paramedic yourself? I did, I did, oh, close to 30 years ago. How many? 30. 30? 30 years ago. It's nice to hear somebody say I've been doing something for 30. I was in the Navy for 38 years. <laughs> uh, what training is required? to be a paramedic. I'd like for all three of you to address that just a little bit. Let's go through Mary. What is training do you undergo? Um, to be a paramedic, well, first of all, you have to be an EMT, and that is a uh, about a semester-long program. Correct. And then after that, you can apply for the paramedic program, which is well, almost a year. And when you say school. EMT, what is an EMT? Uh, an EMT is just uh, basic life support. Um, just they're, they're just somewhere to get just to get a uh, baseline assessment, and uh, they just do base, basic life support before a paramedic can get there to do help. Um, no medic, they don't push any medications or anything like that. They can perform CPR and they can use an AED as well. But they're just there to just get a baseline assessment for the paramedics. Essentially, Joe, there's, there's multiple steps before you can become a paramedic. Oh, well, that's what I want. Yeah. I want, I want sure. our viewers to understand, sure. Orlando, when when Mary and Cameron answered the call to come to, to take care of me, sure. they found I had a stroke. What were their qualifications to jump into the home and assess the situation and put me in one of these vehicles and take me off to a hospital. Sure, just like paramedic Kamush said, essentially the first step is becoming an emergency medical technician. So you hear the, the term EMT. Okay. The EMT is 16 weeks of training, a uh, little over 250 hours, and that encompasses just basic anatomy and physiology, cardiology, how to manage patients with strokes and cardiac disease and neurological impairment. Um, and then, once they complete that training, if they elect to do so, then in order for them to become a paramedic, they have to be an EMT, and then they begin their paramedic training. Paramedic training now is over 1,100 hours of training. That's, that's, that's over a year's training in addition to the 16 weeks of EMT training. Where did, where did 
Where did you go for your uh, paramedic training? Where did um, you receive it, Mary? Indian River Community College. Okay. At, a, at a college. So is it a school that teaches this? The or? community college. There's some independent schools that, 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 that offer the training. That's okay. Correct. How long have you been an acting paramedic then, Cameron, in, in your case? Uh, I've been I'm going to ask you too. I've mean, been an acting paramedic for going on four years now. Four years? Yes, sir. Mary, how long have you? 18. 18 years? Wow. And you've been doing it 30. Would it be a fair question to ask all three of you that the level of training that I am hearing all three of you throw in the stable? Would it be sort of a fair question to say that there would be very few emergency situations that you couldn't address? Can you address almost anything that you might encounter? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. There's, there's going to be some situations that, of course, as paramedic, I mean, we're not physicians. Uh, however, they're trained to identify the algorithm, Joe, is still the same. The pathway is still the same, regardless if you're in the hospital or you're in the pre-hospital setting. These folks are trained to identify this is a life-threatening problem. Essentially, very simple. Is the patient sick or not sick? If they're sick, they bump it up and they know exactly what to do to begin that stabilization process and transport the patient to the most appropriate facility. Okay. When I wrote the questions for the show, it never dawned on me to think other than a home setting. However, you respond to car accidents, fires, mm -hmm. people being hit by falling debris. Mm -hmm. So there's so much that a paramedic has to, has to experience in order to be able to assess and and hook up the, with the right right kind of care. These folks are the ambassadors. The ambassadors to emergency care before the victim gets to the hospital. You call 911, here's your answer, and they'll figure it out. Okay, all three of you, anybody answer this one. Why is it so important for the person that is on scene to immediately call 911 to get the ball rolling, to get an experienced team like Mary and 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 uh, Cameron there. Why is that so important? Well, uh, like in your case, um, if you were to have a stroke, uh, there's a time window that the sooner you call, saying that you're having stroke symptoms, uh, the better chances you are of receiving a certain type of treatment from the hospital, certain medication to correct the, um, the damage you know, that the okay. stroke may have on your body. Okay. Um, like in my case, when you, when, you, when you realize that I'd had a stroke, mm -hmm. I think I'd also had a seizure. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when, you, when, we, when you strap me to the gurney and put me in, into which one did I go in? This one here. This one right here. What did what did you hook me? Up? What did you hook me up to? What do you hook a patient up to? Why why is what you do so much better than having a person like for my wife, for instance, take me in the car to the hospital? What can be done in the fifteen or twenty minutes by by the team? Well, like like I said, we get the ball rolling. We issue a stroke alert, you know, for you, and we. Uh, what we do is that tells the team at the hospital to get ready. They call their, their stroke team and they're going to be ready for you when we bring you there. And it takes them, you know, sometimes, I don't know what the exact time is, 15, 30 minutes. So by the time we get there, they're, re they're ready to receive you. And uh, then on the way there, we'll, we'll do our, our care for you, start an IV for you. Um, we'll uh, transport you at a 30 degree angle and uh, we'll... Uh, just get, just get the ball rolling, we'll get there as fast as we can because time is tissue when it comes to that area because portions of your brain, you, they need oxygen and that's what's happening during a stroke is that portion of your brain is not getting any oxygen. Okay. But realizing the importance of being able to direct fluids or medications into the body, do you as a sort of a matter of practice 
insert an IV into the patient en route to the hospital? Yes, sir. Is that a sort of a standard thing to do? And anytime, anytime we have time to do it, you know, sometimes we have time to do it on scene. Sometimes it, in your case, we're kind of in a rush. We need to get going. We'll just, it's kind of difficult to start it in a bump, bumpy truck, but we can I do know, it. I've had you all do that. Yeah, yeah we, we, we can do it. We're, we're trained. We've got our techniques. You know, each, every paramedic has their own individual technique to do it, but we'll get it done for you. But once you got me into that ambulance and you started to, uh, you were taking me to Woodstock. My wife was sitting up front with you. You were the driver. Yes, sir. Can you describe to our viewing audience the problems that paramedic drivers have with traffic when you're trying to get a case, a patient to the hospital? Well, for one, uh, it's, you know, a lot of times people don't see us. They've got their music turned up and they don't see us coming up. So we, we have our sirens and lights and sirens coming and, you know, we just ask everybody to pull to the right. Um, that, that way we have a clear line of traffic to the hospital. A lot of times that doesn't happen. Some people will just stop in front of you and, you know, we got to, you, you know, sw we're sort of around them. You know, we do it carefully. We don't Try not to come up on anybody too fast. We, do, we just drive emergency to the hospital as quickly and safely as possible. We don't want to, you know, create any more risk or anything. Or you know, I've got to, when I drive to the hospital, I've got my partner in the back that I got to be be careful to, you know, just want to drive nice and easy and nice and smooth, you know, for my partner and of course you are in the back as well. You know, I don't want to make it too. Uh, want to have you or my partner bouncing around in the back too much. So I just take a nice, easy. Uh, it's an easy, safe trip to the hospital, and it's it can be difficult with cars. You know, you know, don't want to get out of the way, but as a sailor, we, we always learn under the rules of the road that you turn to the right, and the ship on your starboard hand on the starboard bow had to right away. So you would make your course change to go behind the ship. I've heard it stated that in uh, crowded traffic that the traffic itself should try to move to the right in order to clear a path for the vehicle. Is that, is that still hold true? Yes, sir. You said, you, yes. Mary? As far as I know, it's all, always what I've been yeah. you know, taught. I think the thing is for, for the uh, drivers not to, uh, to freeze up. Panic. Panic. Yeah. Panic. Yeah. Uh, there's already enough of a panic situation occurring. We don't need to exacerbate it. I think that's a real problem. Yeah. From the time you pick a patient up as a 911 responder, what are some of the other important things that viewers should know that they should do to prepare for you to come to the house? All three? Your first, first and foremost is when they call 911, don't hang up until they're told to hang up. They have to stay on the line with the dispatcher. Do you have people that hang up? They hang up, they hang up. Okay, you're on your way, goodbye. The dispatchers are trained to provide what we call emergency medical dispatch instructions. So they're able to provide some assessment over the phone and convey it to the arriving paramedics. Number two, what they can do is be, have, have a family member readily available to provide pertinent medical information to the arriving paramedics. These folks need to know the allergies, medications. Uh, we have Brevard County Fire Rescue has the Vial of Life program, which is really simple, um, helping the folks just keep their medications organized on a list that can, because remember, during an emergency, not too many folks, and understandably so, are thinking clearly. So 911 arrives, they're asking, they're moving. They're, we gotta have this, we gotta have this, we gotta have this. And if you're not prepared, it just, makes it a little bit more difficult. Nothing we can't overcome, but it makes it that much more difficult because they're focused on the patient. They want information. So being organized, having a plan is essential. You mentioned a vial of life. I know that the vial of life program is already on our website, helpingseniorsofrevard.com. We have your video on of, of the program on our website. Terrific. So people can see it. But how about, what have you, what have you just, Tell the viewing audience what is the Vital Life Program? What, what's on that piece of paper? Or where is it kept? Well, the goal is that that piece of paper obviously will contain the, the patient's name, information, medical information, contact information. And then 
the whole concept is to have that piece of information stored in a vial and then it's kept in the refrigerator. When these folks go through school, they're trained to be on the lookout, if you will, that when they arrive at someone's home, front door, side window, look for these stickers that say vial of life. They automatically then know vial of life recipient, I'm gonna start looking in the refrigerator if this individual is unresponsive and unable to provide information. So again, the vial of life saving crucial time even if the patient's unconscious. Cameron, you mentioned team. You and Mary work together as a team, right? Yes, sir. You're the driver and you're in the back. We take oh, yeah. turns. We rotate. So we take you drive? Oh, yeah, sure. She's driving, yeah. I'm a better driver. Do you feel safe when she's driving? Sometimes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's an interesting thing. You never think about that. Um, yes. We rotate every other call. So if I like, uh, if I take one call, the next call, she'll take that call. Then I'll be in the back with the patient. But in addition to you, one of you being the driver, the other person in the back tending to the patient, mm -hmm. is there an ongoing dialogue between the two of you as to what's happening with the patient? Yes, sir. We have a, uh, there's a little hole that the driver window. can talk a window, I guess, a window to the back so we can, if anything's going on, like uh, say we got railroad tracks coming up and hey, hold on, we're gonna we're gonna go over some railroad tracks. Okay. You know, I'm gonna break and slow down, so give her an idea, just start looking for something to hold on to or, you know, brace herself, you know, if uh, she's starting an IV in the back, hey, can you call up this next stop sign? Can you stop for a second while I start, start the IV? You know, just a little communication, so we good teamwork, make sure we get, you know, better patient care like that. Okay, so let's talk about time sequence just a little bit and the importance of the uh, establishment of the dialogue between the two paramedics and the hospital staff. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important in most cases? I, I would say that there might be some calls you respond to where that wouldn't be as important. But I would think for heart attack and stroke, mm -hmm. or if you had a crash victim with bleeding, those three situations would probably be more of a cause for that hospital dialogue to be established as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. what, what can you offer our viewers about that type of situation and, uh, and, and the importance of getting hooked up quickly? And what you, what can you do? Why is it so valuable to establish that? It's just like better preparation so the hospital can has their staff ready for it to receive the patient. You know, we've got a STEMI alert in case, or a STEMI alert or cardiac alert in case somebody's having any heart issues. So they have a cardiac team ready to perform intervention, even more interventions when we get there. They have a stroke alert, so they'll have a stroke team ready for when we get there. And they also have a trauma alert team for the patients that are bleeding. And they'll be ready for the uh, the trauma of the patients that's bleeding when we get there. So it's just so that the the hospital's ready and prepared with their all their equipment because uh, they have they have even more uh, better intervention equipment than we do. We're just there to stabilize the patient and bring them to the hospital. Okay, do you want I, I just want to add just to because I think you hit a very good point. Yeah. Just to emphasize the importance of time and having our community members. Don't waste any time. I mean, we go under this phrase that says time is heart muscle, time is brain tissue. We've even taken it a step further where if you're having a heart attack, these folks have the capability of transmitting your electrocardiogram to the cardiologist on duty. That's so, what I, I wanted them to, we're, I wanted that's to correct. talk about yeah. That. Oh, yeah. So. That's, that's what I meant about the flow of information. Like, you can hook a patient up, a, to an EKG mm -hmm. in in the ambulance mm -hmm. and it's transmitted continuously to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Let's say at that come do you do you or have you used the paddles in the uh, in the ambulance right. to uh, to to bring the patient back? Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, you sir. have done that. Does that do you do? Is that something you can do on your own initiative, or is that something that the hospital staff would tell you to do? Uh, we we do it on our own. On your own? Yes. Sir. There are, there are yes. some. I just I'm sorry. I just want to because I mean you're asking some great questions, um, and that's one of the biggest misconceptions that these folks are directly when they arrive at the scene, regardless of what the emergency is, they have to be in contact with the physician. 
these folks work independently. They only let the physician know that they're coming in or if they encounter a situation that they might request some orders outside their, their normal practice standard of care. But other than that, they work under our medical director. They have what we call offline uh, a direction, which is protocols, direction. It's almost like a recipe book. And they function independently. The radios can be silent, can go dead, and these folks know what to do. That's why it's so important to make that initial phone call. Absolutely. Um, to get the whole thing started. Mm -hmm. But I, a question I had was one of the parts of one of the questions. It was the value of your contact with the emergency room staff. I think that that uh, it, it brings so many more sets of, of eyes and, and brain power to the, what's ever happening in the back of that, that ambulance. That is correct. That cal uh, collaboration has to exist. It's a team. It's not just them in the field, the hospital staff in the ED. It's a unity. They've got to come together in order for the betterment of the patient. And I'm sure, because they live it. They, they transfer the patient over the physician and the nurses so they can tell you better than I can. Yep. In all the years, Mary, that you've been doing this, what would you say, or could you say, what was one of the most important things that a paramedic can bring to establishing um, a status quo with the patient. Uh, like for instance, would the, uh, your capability to administer oxygen or your capability to intravenously administer medication, uh, there, I'm sure there are medications that if they're put in through the vein can, can react quickly with whatever the medical situation is. Uh, these are all things that paramedics can do in that little ambulance on wheels. Mm -hmm. I know I'm missing some important things. What am I missing? What, as you're sitting here, you see, you're asking the questions, but what are some of the things, Orlando, that it's you're hearing me ask and, and all three of you respond to? What are some of the things that the viewer should take away from our session that we even that I haven't addressed yet. I think I mean your questions are right on the mark. I think it's important to convey to the, the viewers that these folks initially are going to do on the scene and during transit what the emergency room staff is going to do if they were to walk in to the emergency department. So we can't say enough to encourage folks that if they're exhibiting, experiencing any symptomatology, symptoms, they're not feeling well, that's what we're here for. That's what they're here for. And just like Fireman Burris said, they can start an IV, they can give you medications. If you stop breathing, they can put a tube into your airway and start resuscitating you. You know, when you ask Fireman Demush, have you ever put the paddles? It, it's pretty routine. I mean, that's, I mean, we run, we respond to a little over 300 cardiac arrests a year. And this is what they do. So to them, resuscitation is part of their daily routine. How about uh, the use of tracheotomies? Mm -hmm. Are you trained in performing a tracheotomy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done a tracheotomy? No, sir. We Have trained. you done one? You, you've never done a tracheotomy? No, it's a but, but, if I, but if I've never done it, sir, but we've been trained, then Based on my training, I, I'm, I'm fully confident in doing it. Have you did in your in your time? Did you ever have to? Yes. You were part of a team that had to do a tracheotomy. Yes. Uh, viewers may not know what a tracheotomy is. Who who wants to say what it is? Mary. Um, I'm not getting you to talk. Okay. You talk. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Well, the reason we would perform one would be if um, patient needs an airway. And right. we normally would insert the airway through the mouth, but um, some situations, a bad accident, or um, anything that would involve you to have a lot of facial trauma, or you know where there'd be a lot of blood, or um, or such in the airway that you couldn't easily pass an airway tube, then we would you know take a scalpel and find a certain landmark in your mm -hmm. throat on the outside and. Um, but once you open up, do you put a tube in there then? Yes. You put a tube to keep it open. Mm -hmm. But see, 
that's something. If that becomes necessary to do that, that person driving the patient to the hospital can't do that. And in the course of the 7, 8, 12, 14, or 15 minutes that it takes to get that patient to the hospital, you can lose the patient. So again, it gets back to the importance of time and understanding what you can do. How, how is the paramedic, since you know, this is a good question for you, how, how do we, the public, pay for the provision of this service? Well, there's the, uh, the general fund, which is you know, uh, a, a charge to the individuals that, that live in Brevard County, because we are the only 911 transport emergency provider in Brevard County. And the other way that we obtain some revenue is through our transport fees. Is that Transport fees. So when we transport you, you know, there there is a fee for the services. Okay, and then a lot of people have insurance that way. That is correct. That okay. Is correct. As a director, do you believe that you have adequate funding for the provision of these services, especially with the exponential growth of the senior population in Brevard County? And that's the question that, as a director, I always want more. I, I always, I always want to see us grow and, and be able to pay these folks. I'm talking safety factor now, no? Safety. Let's, let's, put, let's put right on the line. Mm -hmm. You got a, 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 an instrument here operated by trained people that can save lives if they have the resources to do it. Do you see in the future a need for an increase in funding for Brevard County Fire and Rescue? I would have to say yes, because healthcare is changing, um, and I don't think we have the time to get into it now, but yes, to answer your question is yes. Healthcare is evolving. Uh, the dynamics of how we're going to be doing business in the next couple of years is going to change. Uh, there are some discussions that even the fire department is not only going to be doing 911 responses, but for example, in your situation, it won't be out of the norm that in about three years from now, you'll have fire medic demotion, fire medic birth stopping by your home after you've been discharged from the hospital and making sure that you're taking your medication, making sure that you don't have anything um, wrong at that current time that, you know, that you'll have to go back into the hospital. So home health care is not out of the possibility for us. Okay, as a potential client, and I don't want to be another one, it's impossible. We're out of time, but I want to thank you, but I think it's extremely important for our viewers to understand that this is a program that is absolutely essential to the continued care of people in Brevard County. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you viewers for watching today's episode of Focus on Seniors. If you have questions or comments, please call us at 321-473-7770. For more information on senior care and resources, visit our website at helpingseniorsofbrevard.com and be sure to listen to Focus on Seniors on radio station AM 1300 WMEL, but also look for us in your Florida Today newspaper each Thursday morning for our Focus on Seniors call. I'm Joe Steckler, and thank you for joining us today for Focus on Seniors.